There we go. All right, welcome everybody. This is our second March um, demonstration and uh, continuing on with the spring theme of fantastic florals. Um, we're actually gonna do a painting today, another, another French impressionist, uh, Camille Pissarro. Um, and this one is, is more of a landscape. It's sort of a garden scene. It's the artist who's uh, painting his wife or sister or somebody in the garden working. So hopefully this maybe can inspire you to get out and if the weather's good, of course, uh, get into the garden and get started there. Um, before we do that, I wanna go through the usual uh, rigmarole of uh, going over the supplies and getting everybody, <coughs> excuse me, getting everybody um, sorted out with all that information. So let's uh, blink right over to the supply list screen. And we've got, and, and again, I will be actually using this, uh, this palette of colors. Um, so it's uh, oils, uh, Artislav oil, titanium white, uh, yellow ochre, raw umber, cerulean blue hue, brilliant red, and medium yellow. So the three primaries, a couple of earth tones, and white. Um, if, if you've got more, if you've got less, you can probably uh, do this. And actually, if you work in acrylics, um, you don't have an oil set up, Acrylics will work, uh, of course, the, the usual applies with acrylics that they dry faster, so be aware. Um, you also need some oil painting medium that can be linseed oil or um, liquid or gam, uh, what do they call it? Gam, not Gamsol, but the Gamblin product from, uh, from Portland, my old hometown. Um, and you'll need a cotton rag or paper towels, a container, uh, for putting your solvent or medium, whichever you choose to use, if you use them at all. Um, and then a variety of paintbrushes, which you'll see me, and I'll, I'll sort of go over those as we go through them. Uh, and cotton, linen, canvas, wood, paper, all for painting on, all which should be primed with uh, acrylic gesso um, so that they don't, especially with oils being fairly corrosive, um, can leak into especially paper and wood and, and kind of cause it to slowly deteriorate over time. Uh, what, uh, with, with, um, with paper, it does it pretty quickly. So um, definitely put that layer of gesso on. And then a palette to put your colors on. So that's, uh, that's pretty much your uh, list of supplies to go over. Um, if you have any questions about supplies or anything else, just put them in the chat and um, Chanel will pick them up and um, can relay them to me and we can sort that out. Um, so let's go over to the painting. This is a really wonderful landscape, very light filled, very atmospheric. Uh, it's Camille Pissarro, the artist garden at Eragni. Um, and this, uh, this painting is actually in the National Gallery in Washington, DC. So if you're in the Washington, DC area, be on the lookout next time you go into the museum. Um, it's free to get into the National Museum. Last I checked anyway, it's been a while since I've been to that one. Um, this is from 1898. So this is a, uh, a painting that's sort of after the height of Impressionism, but the Impressionists will still painting like this and, and still doing their thing. Um, but this is a good 20 years, uh, maybe even 30 years after the Impressionists sort of uh, burst onto the scene in Paris. Um, feel free, I've got this up here for you to take a picture of, a screenshot if you want to. Um, you can also do a little search of this particular painting. It comes up really quickly. So if you type in Pissarro, the artist garden, um, this will come up and you'll be able to sort of have a bigger one that you can work from off to the side. So um, I, I wanna give everybody an opportunity to look at this, can you know just maybe do a, a search or a screenshot and you can use that as your, as your guide. It'll also be up in the corner of our scene. So without further ado, let's head over to the work table. And what I have got today is um, canvas. I'm working on a canvas pad um, and it's, this is, uh, the one that I've, the very specific one that I got is a uh, nine by, yep, nine by 12. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, 20, oh no, there's only 10 sheets in this one, um, but they're all pre-prepared. So they, they come like, I'll take this out here. They come like this. 
um, the top side is already gessoed, so I didn't have to do that. Um, you can always put another layer of gesso on there if you want to, if you want to add a little texture or something like that, but I, I usually don't. Um, and they are ready to go as long as you don't try and paint on the backside. And it looks a little bit creamier. You can sort of see the difference here. This is the backside and this is the, this is the front side. This has got the gesso on it, this doesn't. So this is a little bit sort of earthier and creamier. Um, you don't want to paint directly on that. It just really sucks up the paint. Um, and it, it's, you're, you're just constantly trying to kind of re, uh, you know, reapply the paint because it's, it's just absorbed right into it. It's really kind of a pan neck. Um, and in this one, I have prepared it and I've prepared a few others with a mix of yellow ochre and raw umber to sort of give it sort of an earthy brown. Um, and that is something that I like to do. It's not necessary. You certainly can paint on white canvas. Um, I just like to have that, that ground. And especially with the landscape, to have something earthy and, and somewhat warm like this is a good, is a good place to, to start. So um, that's something that I like to do uh, to get the painting. There we go, that's better. Um, to get the... Uh, uh, surface ready for paint. Okay, so the painting that I have is probably slightly more square than um, my uh, canvas here. So I'm going to have to make that adaptation as I as I move along, um, and it's it's going to be fairly easy to do that. Um, these first few marks that I make, if you follow these. Um, demonstrations uh, over the over the the last few months. You know that I like to start with kind of an underpainting. Uh, just uh, in this case, I'll just do it as a sketch, kind of in in uh, this color right here, which is raw umber. Um, and you can see that I put this on. I did this last week, and this is super helpful with oils, especially. Is I put it on a paper towel, and what that does is there's a, there's a little ring of oil around it and you can kind of see it's kind of dirty along the edge. Um, the towel will suck up that excess oil so it's not so runny and fluid. And um, if you've got too much oil in it, it can also increase the drying time pretty substantially. So I like to put my paints, if they, especially if they're runny, on a sheet um, of uh, paper towel, just anything absorbent really <clears throat> will work an old napkin, something like that. You can even do it on an old t-shirt or a paint rag or something like that. Paper towels work particularly well for, for that uh, particular task. So um, that's something I like to do before I get started. Um, so that's been sitting there for about 10 or 15 minutes. And so the brush I'm gonna use just to get, get things started is part of that, that kit that I have uh, been using as well. These, these kind of nice little sort of very affordable entry-level brushes. Um, I've got one that's a set of bristle brushes, which is sort of rougher and more textured. And then these brushes here, which are, and it's the one that I'm using right now, actually. And this is a little smoother. They're synth synthetic sables. So I'm going to start with, with that one as well. Um, and I'm just going to get a little bit of medium out here. And this medium here is a mix of linseed oil and uh, liquin, which is a Winsor Newton product and is available most places you can get art supplies, including Michael's. Um, so I'm gonna use this just to make the, the paint a little bit more fluid and flowy. So let's get this off of here because it's pretty much ready to go. And- Hey, Mike. Yeah. Um, your overhead camera is shaking a lot. Is it? Okay, yeah. Okay, well, let's, maybe we're having an earthquake here. I don't even know about it. All right, I, mean, I think maybe my leg, what is that? Yeah, I see that, it's very strange. I don't know why it's doing that. There's nothing shaking in my house. Yeah, it seems, I don't know why, it seems more like the video is shaking rather than the actual like camera, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, let me just tighten things up a little bit, so. No, that's not doing it. 
Let's do that. Let's see how that works. Yeah, it looks to be something in in the actual feed for some reason because there's nothing nothing shaking. Um, strange. Hmm. Well, I would suggest maybe restart restarting it or. All right, let's try that. <clears throat> Bear with me for a moment here, folks. All right, let's open it back up. Did that just start or was that doing that the whole time? I don't remember. That seems more stable. Let's see how this goes. Still doing it. Hmm. You're right. Huh. I don't know why it would be doing that. Now that one, I just sort of kicked it. Oh yeah, it's really weird. That's never happened before. That's a new one. Yeah, it's a new one for me as well. Yeah. I just wanna make sure that nothing is shaking. I've got some things on my desk here that would shake as well and they're not shaking. So it's definitely something with the feed. Try it one more time. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. And now that doesn't seem to be shaking. Yeah, that seems but whenever better. I go to the over the overhead. Yeah, it's really weird. And it's very strange. I have no idea why it's doing that either. It's only an overhead too. Here, let me just try something. Because I'm just holding that with my hand and that's not doing anything. Seems pretty stable. Yeah. Well, I'll be, I've never seen that before. Let's try this. It seems like it should be. Huh. Here I am just holding it. It's still shaky. Well, I think we're just going to have to muddle through, it seems like. Yeah, I think so, too. All right. Maybe it'll just stabilize as we go along. Anyway, as exciting as that was, we do have to move on. And I really do apologize for that. I just don't know what it is. OK, so I'm just going to go. And I'm going to get a little bit of medium on here, and I'm just going to sketch out the uh, I'm going to sketch out the general design here of this painting. All right. So first things first, you're always looking for a um, you know sort of big pieces of the puzzle in a painting like this, where you've got a lot of moving parts. You know, you've got sort of the sky, you've got a house, you've got the garden itself. Um, I'm seeing a nice little kind of slant where the garden meets the foliage at about a quarter of the way up. So like right over here is where it starts. And, and it kind of goes like this and then down a little bit. So I like, I like to sort of mark where I start and where I'm gonna end and kind of do a little connect the dots kind of thing. So just a little something like that. That's the first piece uh, that I want to establish right off the bat, just that nice horizon line. It's like a pulsing. It's weird. All right. I'm going to ignore it. I promise. Okay. So now I'm just going to work up from this, um, just sort of establish these trees. So at about a quarter is where the garden starts. And then probably a little bit more than that. So at about a third of the way down, these are just little hash marks that I like to make. This is where the kind of the tree line starts. 
And it pretty much goes uh, right across there. This is kind of the one right by the house. So I'm just gonna kind of dash it in a little bit here and establish kind of the main, uh, the main points as I work my way across this, this middle ground area and not going too dark, not trying to get you know, too much worked out here. There's a nice sort of straight geometric line that I can get right here. Just box this house in. There's a, there's a slight, um, maybe that goes, over. no, that's about right. Maybe this goes down a little bit here. This roof like that. So this is why I like to use these, um, these uh, sable brushes more at this stage because they give me a little bit, you know, I can be kind of rough with it like this, but I also can be a little bit more of a, of a fine, uh, a fine mark making brush does what I need to do in, in kind of multiple directions, loose, and also can be a little bit tighter. So there's my little chimney there. Uh, I'm just gonna work my way down here. And as, as far as the main elements go, I've pretty much got everything. I've got sort of the foreground, the middle ground, and then the background. So just doing something quick like that to establish your overall co uh, composition uh, is, is pretty much how I'm gonna start everything. The impressionist always has sort of a nice lively brushwork. Um, so, you know, I'm not worrying too much about getting everything precise because I'm gonna kind of go back and forth a little bit. Maybe gonna establish um, sort of the structure of the trees a little bit more firmly. Put some, some of that in there. There's sort of the, the flower hedge here, right through that, maybe just establish these. This is going to be so fun because there's like tons of uh, little dabs of color all throughout this one. I'm not going to be able to get every single element perfectly established. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to get the entire color range, uh, but I want to, I certainly want to get the, the main structure of things. And so now I, I might just sort of block in, you know, this is kind of a darker shape right here. Not worrying about color, just trying to think of values at this stage. It's a good, it's a good way to start really most any painting is if, if, you can, if you can understand how the lights and darks work. One, it takes the, the, the pressure off. You know, everybody's like, oh, I, color mixing so hard, it's so difficult. I, I I would say that probably 65 to 75% of the, the problems I see with, with people having with, uh, with painting is, is related to value more than it is to color. Because if you don't have that range of lights and darks, um, the color is the color's not gonna work. Um, and, and you're also gonna be fighting, you're gonna be fighting the color instead of really taking uh taking stock of of the values so really try and uh try and look at those values the lights and the darks the shadows and the highlights if you want to think of it that way all right so i'm just doing a little getting a little bit of medium in here to make the flow a little better we have a couple of questions yeah how about it um the first one is what brush number are you are you using oh yeah that's a good one that's a this is number uh, number five so it's sort of a small to mid-sized brush. And, and that has more to do with the size of the um, uh, canvas that I'm using. If I were using something that were maybe twice as big, you know, like an 18 by 24 or something like that, I would definitely be using a larger brush. So use whichever is appropriate for um, the area that you're working on. And then the other question that we have is, is it okay to use acrylic as the underpainting? Yeah, absolutely. The the brown that I have here is acrylic. And I do that just simply because it dries faster and I don't want to, you know, wait a day or two for the uh, oil painting or the oil paint to um, to dry before I can start painting. This was this was ready to go in like 15 minutes. So by all means, if you wanted to do the, the what we're doing here in acrylics, um, that would also make a lot of sense as well. I just like to have that brown as kind of a it sort of pulls some color together a lot of times. It, it gives it a, a little sense of unity. 
So now I'm just looking for uh, shifts in value here. So this, this uh, sort of hedge of flowers like I painted earlier, that's a little bit lighter. And then that sort of mid size uh, shrub hedge, you know, like sort of bigger, smaller trees, bigger, or bigger, <laughs> bigger, smaller trees, trees in between big and small, medium size. Um, those are um, a little darker. So I'm, I'm just kind of trying to take stock of, of all the shifts as we, as we establish this early stages. Okay. And I'm I'm not entirely sure. I think some of the some of the impressions impressionist painters, uh, you know Claude Monet and uh, and others um, may have done this, but probably didn't do uh, a, like kind of a brown underpainting. This is more of a sort of a historically speaking, a, a kind of a more classical approach, like the old Renaissance painters and Baroque painters of the 15 and 1600s would have almost always done something like this. I think it was more of uh, uh, a personal preference thing rather than like kind of an imperative uh, for the Impressionists. The Impressionists were basically rebelling against the classical painters. So, you know, anything the, the classical painters did, uh, the Impressionists would go, eh, I probably don't want to do that. All right, so I'm going to block this area in here as well, it's a little darker. It's like painting on a boat. We're, we're out at sea and we're looking in to the garden. Not too bad though. All right, so just sort of getting a few little darker details, more for guidance sake than anything else. All right. So I think, um, do I want to put the little gardener in there? Yes, I probably should. It's the theme that we want to go with. And you can see how this, the, the figure kind of comes into some of this lighter area here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm just not going to worry about lights and darks on the figure. I'm just going to try to block her in as a shape. And then I'll show you a little trick you can do to kind of define it a bit more. So she there she is stooped over weeding or planting or whatever she's doing. Just trying to get the shape in. And then if you uh, want to take a little piece of paper, a Q-tip sometimes works. That would have been a good thing to have today. You can just take a little bit of paper here and just do a little, a little guide, a few guide marks here. So arms are a little bit lighter. The face here is a little bit lighter. So I'm just, I'm just sort of dabbing in a, a few vague details here. I'm not gonna spend too much time with that. And then just for a, kind of a reference here, I might put this, that little line there. And then you got your little plants all through here. I'm not gonna count them. There's probably more or less than I'm putting in, but I'm not worried about that. I'm just trying to, again, give myself uh, the lay of the land, literally and figuratively. There we go. Got all this stuff over here. I don't know, you know what that is. Looks like some weed she's pulled out, like maybe some old last year's rose bushes, something like that. All right. Okay, I think we're ready. Let's get into some more color now. So um, this is another tip that I like to share with people. This is the paint that I used from last week. And all I did is I put it in a little takeaway box for, I don't know if it was like Thai food or curry or whatever it was. Um, and then if you want, you can sometimes put like a, a wet sponge in there. A little moisture will, will always help it last a little longer. But as long as you're sealing it up uh, with a, a lid so that the air is not in there, it's going to definitely slow the drying time down. So I'm just going to pull out my blue from last week. And it's mostly good. Yellow ochre. A little bit of red. The red stayed um, stayed pretty fresh. And then there was a gray. I'll leave that there because I don't need it. And this is this is some brown, which I don't really need because I got a ton of it there. All right. So there's my my colors. 
Um, and you'll notice that the drying times of different colors uh, are very different. Um, red stays open longer. This particular red does. Um, the one that I use, the raw umber, is very, very quick drying, relatively speaking, in terms of uh, oils go. Uh, like this will probably, if I just left this as is, probably be dry tomorrow, you know, within 24 hours. Um, but if I did something else that was a, a little bit uh, slower drying, it, it might take a, a few days. So you kind of have to um, operate under the assumption of the slowest drying paint that you're using uh, is, is kind of your standard because it's, it's going to be the one that, that dries last. All right, I'm going to get a little bit of white, titanium white here. And we're going to try and mix up we're going to try and mix up that um, that sky color. It's a very muted, um, uh, sort of bluish. It looks like it almost has a little bit of yellow in it too. So I'm going to try this uh, blue, cerulean blue hue. I'm going to throw a little bit of this yellow ochre in there. Sort of push it to the green end. I mean, you, you basically your your blues are either going to go. In, in sort of a warmer, more um, purple direction, um, or they're gonna go a little bit more in the yellowish direction of greens and things like that. I feel like that sky is a little bit, I'm pretty much out of this blue. I feel like that one is a little bit more on the green end. So I'm just gonna try this. So this is kind of probably 60% 60, 60 blue, 40% yellow, um, and we'll see how that goes. So I'm just gonna mix it with white, and now we're gonna make a tint of it because it is definitely lighter. So I'm gonna try that. That seems pretty good, actually. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna commit to this. Now, the Impressionists were not big on, uh, generally speaking, not modifying their, their paint. They, they, they would, just take the paint and, and kind of and kind of put it in there. Just lay it lay it in. And um, I'm going to try I'm going to try that approach today. Uh, it's, it's more what's called a la prima. So I'm not thinning things out, and I'm not going to. I'm, I'm just going to take the paint and, and go directly onto the canvas. I think this blue is going to end up being a little bit um, a little bit light or a little bit dark. Excuse me. Um, and I'm going to pick a brush here. Let's try this one. This is a flat. This is number five. So it's the same size as, a, as the last one we used, but it's a bristle brush. So it's rougher and it is a flat. So it, it has a, a very long end and then a very, very tiny short end like that. So it's, it's definitely a, a different approach here. And I'm just gonna try and just blot this in here nice and loosely. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm noticing right off the bat, this is too dark. So you can, in the impressionist manner, just take some white and just modify it as you're putting it on there, kind of a wet into wet approach. And if you, if you get a chance to see this, um, this painting uh, or a picture of this painting, um, notice how broke, it's called a sort of a broken surface. There's a lot of broken color in here. Um, so you can see the brush marks. So if we get a close up, let's see how our camera does with close up. Uh, it's still a little shaky. Jeez, um, you can you can see the brush marks, and that's that's really um, kind of a hallmark of the impressionists. They were they were not they were not creating a lot of smooth passages in their paintings. They were much more. Um, I'm just going to put a little medium in there just to spread the paint a little bit more. Um, they were very much about the brush mark and the kind of the immediacy and, and being out in nature and getting out of the studio uh, and, and creating a, a more experiential uh, painting. So it looks like it's getting a little darker over here. So I'm just gonna add a little bit more of that sort of the root color that I put in. I'm not worried about the clouds yet. Um, I'll get to that. So just sort of mixing up a little bit, sort of a variety of tones here. Some of it's a little lighter, some of it's more mid-tone, some of it's a little bit slightly darker. 
Um, if I wanted to add some of this blue here to kind of make it even darker, pull some of that in. So this is kind of how the impressionists would have been working. They would have been they, they would have been responding to atmospheric conditions and and to the you know the the, the changing light and um, it was really a, a completely revolutionary uh, way of working. So I throw a little more yellow in there, make maybe make this a little warmer. So I've kind of mixed up another tone here. It seems to get a little bit lighter and a little bit warmer as we go over to this side. Maybe this is where the light source is. There's nothing worse than just taking blue and going, you know, break it up a little bit, play, play around with different tones. I mean, this painting um, doesn't have much beyond the sort of the green, you know, this, this sort of triad of, of yellow ochre, uh, the blue and the white uh, mix, but you can sometimes add a little more yellow, add a little more blue, add a little more white, and just, and just kind of break up the, the, the surface. I mean, that is really the way um, an actual landscape works. It's, it's not static. It's, it's always changing. There's always um, shifts in color and value and things like that. So I'm, I'm trying to uh, keep that spirit active with these. That's probably a little bit too much yellow. So let's throw a little bit more of that blue in there. There we go. And, and you'll also notice that I'm that I'm keeping some of the underpainting just popping through for the time being. I mean, if I find it a little bit distracting later on, I can I can do that. Yeah, this is starting to get a little bit more yellow in here, which um, generally as you get closer to the horizon, it gets a little lighter and, and ten, has a tendency to get a little warmer. So like that. And now I'm going to throw a little a few clouds in here. And so that's going to be vastly more white, obviously, but not pure white. So it's it's got a little bit of, of what's I've mixed up here. Um, and so I'm just going to lay this on here. And if, if you work really thick like that, um, you can you can you can get that on there before it kind of blends too much. So that was I was able to kind of get away with that um, without it getting too contaminated. Now I left this this unpainted, so because I do want these to be a little bit more um, abruptly white and noticeably white, but not pure white again. Because if you look in there, there's quite a bit of variety in there. There almost looks like there's a kind of a little bit of a pink in these clouds. So mine are a little bit cooler. So what I can do is just throw a tiny bit of red in there. And so that'll, that'll warm it up even more and then shift the color away from that green. Yeah, just a little bit. Let's have a look. Let's try that. My skies, I would say, is a little bit overall, a little bit darker. Um, but it's not not working, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep keep at it. And you notice how my the direction of my brush strokes mix it up, you know, this way down side to side, more vertical. Just give yourself a little bit of a uh, variety with your marks. You know, if you're always going like this, um, you're you're gonna have a very statically horizontal a uh, series of marks that might not be terribly interesting after a while. Mix it up. All right. Yeah, so this this pink is contrasting with these cooler colors a little bit better. So I'm, I'm liking that. Let's see, here we got a couple more over here. Just kind of blending it in, let it sort of integrate into some of the color that's around it. Kind of a nice, you know, it's very subtle, but it's like if this is a little bit more blue, this is a little bit more sort of that that green, then it gets lighter down here towards the horizon. Um, so there's there's sh subtle shifts and that's, you know, that's what's the difference between an interesting pa painting and a little bit more of a static painting is 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 that that color is is constantly shifting and the sense of light is is changing. So play, play around with that. With, with 
the brush marks, um, with the color shifts, all of it. All right, I think that's a good that's a good start. So now I want to go into there's a lot this being a garden, and this being a floral painting. There is a lot of green in there, so I'm going to shift my colors. And I'm also going to shift brushes here. And I think I'm going to go with a slightly bigger brush. A oh no, it's not slightly bigger. It's exactly the same. It's a five, but it's round. So it's smaller. And it's a bristle brush because it's giving me a nice texture as I'm building this up. So I'm going to mix up a lot of the, the, the greens here in the in the foliage. So that's that's my next step. So to do that, I'm going to need more blue. Um, so I am going to grab my blue. Where did my blue go? It's around here somewhere. And I'm going to put out some uh, yellow. Let me put the yellow out first. Uh, and I'm going to use a, a brighter yellow. This is uh, called medium yellow, which is a basically a primary yellow. So I'll put that out here. I'll put this over. There we go. That one's a little bit runny, but not so bad. I'm not going to. I'm not going to worry about it in terms of uh, getting the uh, getting the paper towel out to blot it. And I'm gonna dip into my other set here and try, try a different set. So this is another set of paints here. This is a, a 24 count oil painting set, um, really cheap, like 10, 12 bucks, something like that. And you get a ton of colors in here. So I'm just gonna try a slightly different blue. Um, let's go with, oh, cerulean blue hue. That's exactly the same color as I had there. I want to try a different one. Actually, I'll have a couple of them out. There we go. Ultramarine, which is sort of your classic blue. I just wanted to get a different one from the, the one that we have. Uh, ultramarine is probably your most prevalent blue. Um, and it is, it creates sort of a nice earthy green. So that's my, see that one's got a lot of oil in it. So I may, may douse this with a little bit of, just try and suck up some of that. There we go. It actually absorbed really quickly. So super helpful. There we go. And, and then I'm gonna use the, the one that's on the list, which is the cerulean blue hue, which is, uh, more of the blue that we had up here, which creates a little bit more vibrant greens. Um, you know, like this tree right here is probably going to be a little bit more vibrant than some of the other ones. So it just gives me um, this one I'm going to pour out on here. Yeah, there we had a little bit of oil separation. So take care of that. Let that soak up a little bit. So we got two blues. Blues, to my mind, are that that is the color where you're going to get the most variety. So in other words, the difference between a cadmium red and a, like a, a, a naphthol red, um, they're different, but the difference between like a phthalo blue and an ultramarine blue is really pronounced. So um, if you're going to go out and, you know, like, should I get another blue or should I get another yellow? Or should I get another red? Um, for my money, um, blues are probably, um, probably your best bet because they, one, they're pretty strong. In other words, when you when you tint them, they're going to um, where did my brush go? They're going to change pretty dramatically. Uh, like you'll see it when we mix up these different greens. So the first one that I'm going to do is I'm just going to mix up. I'm actually going to keep this in here because uh, no, actually I'm not because I don't want to start with too much white. Um, I'm going to start with ultramarine blue and a little bit of this primary yellow, just to kind of show you what I'm talking about. So let's, let's get a little close up on that, shall we? So there's ultramarine over here, or close-ish up. And I'm trying to keep the white out of here. And then I'm just gonna use a ton of yellow because yellow has a much um, weaker tinting strength. So it's green, it's definitely green. Maybe put a little bit more blue in there. But it's not a bright sort of chemlon green, maybe perhaps. It's much more uh, of kind of a, a more earthy green. And so that, that's a good sort of mid green to start with. 
And, and when I'm working on uh, you know, one area, it's nice to have a number of different uh, values of that color worked up. So I'm just gonna make a darker version and I'm gonna add more blue. So this has more blue, this has more yellow. So I'm just making that. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of the umber, not quite that much. I'll just start with a little bit. Cause I want it one to get a little bit darker and I wanted to get a little bit less. Um, I've got some white in there. Got to be careful of your palette. I had some white snuck in there. All right, so that's pretty good. So dark green, light green, and I'll worry about the the or the or mid green, and then I'll worry about the light um, shortly. But I'm just going to start with kind of going back and finding kind of these rich green areas, and let me widen things out a little bit. There we go. We're back to the painting now. Okay. So I'm just going to reestablish these shapes here, just sticking mainly to the darker areas. And over we, here, so we've got a little bit more. We have a couple more questions for you, Mike. Yeah. Shoot. Um, Aurora asked, how do you clean your brush to reuse it um, between colors? Um, well, the, the, the easiest answer to that is use a different brush, especially if you're going from like a light color to a dark color and vice versa. Um, but if you do need to do that, the easiest way to do it is just to wipe this, wipe your brush off as vigorous as you can, as many times as you can in different spots. So you're really getting the paint off. Like if you just go like this over and over again, you're just kind of recycling the paint, but move it around, you know, different spots, do that as much as you can. And then if you just take a little bit of medium, just sort of dip the brush in the medium and kind of use it as like a, um, almost like a solvent. Uh, that's the way I would do it to get basically back to uh, a brush that's, it's not gonna be 100% clean, but it'll probably get you to where you wanna go. Um, as far as cleaning the brush fully, um, I, if, if I, one, I, I sort of like to kind of, keep in the flow a little bit. So that's the way I clean them. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be uh, terribly thorough about it. I just want to get, get it so that whatever I had last time is not going to contaminate um, the, the next color that I'm putting on there. So that's a, that's a quick way to do it. I hope that answers the question. Um. And then Candy has a couple questions. Um, okay. She wanted to know what the name of the red that you're using is. The red here is, uh, it's the Artist Loft brand. It is the Brilliant Red, um, but any, any old uh, primary red would do. Cadmium Red, um, Naphthal Red, uh, even uh, Alizarin Crimson, something like that. Um, and then she also wanted to know what is the difference between burnt umber and raw umber? Oh, that's a great question. That's a paint nerd question. I love it. Uh, raw umber is basically the dirt right out of the ground. Um, and then it's mixed with oil. So it's, it's, it's untreated, it's unaltered. Uh, uh, burnt umber is uh, treated, and I think it's actually burnt, it's heated. So it makes it more of a red warm hue and it's slightly less uh intense uh, well, not intense but it's, it's slightly lighter the value is 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 lighter so um and that's a really important distinction to understand because they are two very different colors i mean they're related but they're they're different so yeah thanks for that Can and then the last question like that, and the last question we have for right now is um, a couple people have been asking what yeah. medium are you using yeah, the medium I'm using is, is a mix between just straight linseed oil and then liquid by Windsor Newton. And I've put them in here about 50-50 and I just shake it up. Um, you can use, you can use I, any of those um, by themselves, like linseed oil you could use by itself or you could use um, liquid by itself. I just like the drying time when you mix it because liquid 
liquin slows the drying time um, or, or, or actually speeds up the drying time, sorry. And then linseed oil slows the drying time. So I, I like to sort of, you know, control my drying time as best I can. All right, so I've got these darks in here and I wanna move into this, this more um, sort of lighter colored green. I'm gonna actually add a little bit of yellow to it. And just kind of go in here and get a little bit of the foliage that's sort of in, in the light. And just kind of dab it in here and sort of use, again, this, this little triangle here uh, of colors. And the impressionist would have, you know, had these three and then, and then probably had, you know, different ones in between it. So the, the value range would have been wider. They also have, if you look in there, there's probably some more earthy stuff. So they probably would have used a, a yellow ochre. So feel free to pull in some yellow ochre in here every now and then, um, just sort of make slightly different greens. So you're really building up uh, the complexity and the richness of, 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 the, of the palette here. Uh, so I'll just go over here, do the same thing. So working my way out from, from dark to light. You, you don't have to do it in that order, but you should have when you're, when you're sort of working your way uh, around a painting like that. So you're working into the greens now, then maybe we can uh, mix up three or four different values of green. So that's kind of the way I work. How you actually apply it is kind of a personal choice. Um, uh, this particular one just seemed logical to kind of go uh, dark to light. But you know, I mean, really, you could do it in any direction you wanted. All right. And what else have we got? Now, this one's really bright here. So I am going to use a different blue. And I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to stick with this. I'm not really cleaning this brush. But I'm just going to throw this, this uh, hue, the cadmium hue, or the cerulean hue, excuse me. And I'm going to mix up a green with that as my base, as opposed to the uh, ultramarine blue. So it just creates a much more kind of uh, acidic almost and really kind of intense blue. It's, you're not really, you can't really see it too much on the, um, on the screen, unfortunately, but it's happening. Yeah, it's, you, can, you can see that difference. This is a little bit more earthy and this is a little bit more intense. And I did not in, include my, um, uh, what did I not include? I completely lost my train of thought. I didn't include something, but I'll figure out what it is. I can't remember. All right. And so I'm getting a lot of kind of dark light stuff going on because the color's mixing a little bit. That's, that's totally fine. That is uh, kind of Im impressionism in a nutshell. So now I'm just kind of laying in between the different uh, different greens, different blue greens, lights and darks, and really just sort of laying it on. I completely forgot this little tree here. This actually looks almost like some massive sunflowers, which it could be. He's got a few sunflowers in here. So, whoops, got to get back to the wide view. There we go. Don't want to miss any of the trees. Very good. All right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears here just a little bit, put this green aside, because a really important element of this is kind of these earthy reds. And I want to get that in because we're running a little bit low on time. So I'm going to get another uh, a brush, a smaller brush, because this is sort of in between. So this is a size two and it's a flat. And I'm going to mix up a, um, a kind of that brick color and the earth color uh, kind of surrounding the garden. So all of this area, this little bit here, because that red green vibration is really important. So I'm just gonna take some of this red. Uh, it's this sort of your brilliant red, you know, whatever you've got is, is fine. And get a little renegade there. And I'm gonna take a little bit of uh, yellow ochre. So it's gonna be more orange. And then I'm gonna tint it, meaning add white to it. So something like that. So that's about 
that's about where I am with that color. And this is supposed to be, let's see how this works. Oh, that's pretty good. I think I got into the ballpark for sure. So I'm just gonna add these um, as kind of the counterpoint, the warm counterpoint to all these cool greens. So like that, and then I'm just gonna take that and, and kind of run with it in here as well. So let's take that color, primary red, yellow ochre, and then a white to, to tint it up. And then I'm just gonna just really scrub this in here, really emphasizing sort of that red earthy French countryside at Eragni. Doesn't sound like a very French name, but I don't know, maybe he had a, maybe he had a place in Italy or something, who knows? I think it was Frank. All right. So we'll lay this in. I, I should probably be using a bigger brush for this, but I'll see what I can do. Put a little medium in here to give it a little bit more length. Letting some of that, that uh, base color kind of creep through. But it kind of, it really brightened. I mean, the, the sense of light really just kind of burst with that color. It was a, it's a very important color in this painting because green and um, red are uh, complements of each other, meaning they're sort of opposite each other on the, uh, on the color wheel. So they kind of activate um, each other, make them more intense, make it more, the green's more green and the red's more red. Uh, so that's, that's a good, when you're looking at a, a painting or you're looking at a scene to paint, you're kind of looking for those little color, uh, dynamics. We have a few more questions for you. Yeah, I'm ready. How do you make colors more translucent? Uh, mix them with medium. That's the, the short, quick answer. Dilute them. Um, most colors right out of the tube are, are semi-transparent. So sort of a mix between transparent and uh, opaque. And to make it more transparent, uh, you're just going to add something to dilute it. It can be mineral spirits. It can be uh, the little mix that I've been using. Uh, but it's, it's, it's definitely something that you're, you're diluting the paint with. How long do you let your work dry before framing it? Um, before framing it? Um, well, that's, a, that's a, a bit of a loaded question. You, you should, you know, like if you were selling this to somebody or going to have it in a show or it was um, you know, going to go to a museum or something like that, you would probably want to varnish your painting, which is sort of adds a protective coat on. And there are varying accounts of how long you're supposed to do that. Um, some people, I'm just going back to the green here to sort of add these little rows of vegetables or whatever they are. Um, some people, you know, say varnish your, your painting uh, months after you've uh, finished it. Like the last mark, just start the clock and say, you know, like if we did this painting, you should wait for it to cure until like, you know, September or October. And then after that, once it's, once it's varnished, um, then you can frame it. Um, so it's not so much before you would frame it. It's, it's if, if you're going to varnish it, which, you know, if that's a choice, you can do it or not. Um, but if you want the paint to be a little bit more protected and, you know, maybe somebody's paying for it and you want to make sure that they're happy with the way you're treating your paintings, varnish it, then frame it. Um, but if I were just, if, you know, I would just, if I just wanted to frame it and, you know, wasn't too worried about the rest of that stuff, um, as long as it's dry to the touch, um, you can frame it. As long as you're not like putting it under glass or something like that, which most paintings are not, they're usually done with a um, just a little 
sort of wooden surround there. Let's see here. So yeah, I hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, and the last question we have for right now is, do you ever use water mixable oils? Um, I don't. Um, and it's, there's no, no good reason why I don't. <laughs> I just have never gotten around to it. Um, I've tried them and, and I don't like the feel of them, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not good. And I know some people that love them, but I think it's just one of those things that you have to get used to. Um, and I just, you know, I've gotten to the stage in my, my painting life where I know what I know and I know how to do it fairly well. And I'm just, I just don't want to kind of relearn, a, especially a technique that's essentially the same as what, uh, you know, oil painting or acrylic painting would be. All right, now I'm just going, going through here and just trying to get all these greens and, and reds. And I think I've got a fairly good job. My red is probably a little bit more intense, but I, I have to say, I kind of, I kind of like it that way. Um, so uh, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it. Now I'm going to come in uh, and start. There's a lot of, I don't have much time, but I'll just do it really quick here. There's a lot of like kind of pinky stuff in through here. So I'm just going to take this brush and probably red it up a little bit. Like there's a couple of Nice little burst right here, like probably some, some roses. And then it's a little bit lighter. So I'm gonna lighten that up and put these little, I don't know, what are they? Uh, oh, that's too white. There we go. Who's, who's to say we couldn't make one of these white? I'm just gonna add a little few highlights, touches of some of these different flowers that are kind of lurking throughout this painting. This one's got a little bit whiter. They're a little bit smaller. I've got some over here. I'll put a little light on the farmer's back. I'm not really gonna pay, be able to pay much, too much attention to her. Oh, and then we got these really nice um, sunflowers up here. So I'm just doing this all with one brush, which is a bit of a, which is a, bit of a risk. Some really nice big sunflowers over here. I'm just kind of working really thick. Let's get a little close up there. You can see how, see how kind of meaty and cake frosting like this is. And just sort of punching those in there. There's a couple of those over here as well. Oops, over there. Getting a little bit over, over here. It's hard to keep track of where I am. All right, I didn't get to the house. Um, here, let's do the house really quick. <laughs> I'm gonna mix up a gray. So this is like pizza painting. This is the end of the day. You got a little bit of the, little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm just gonna mix up a gray. Let's see how I do. And we'll put that in here. Oh, that's not bad. That's fairly close. That was a little bit of blue, that was a little bit of brown, was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then down here, it's a little bit warmer. So I'm gonna keep that gray, but I'm just gonna warm it up. Really didn't change a whole lot from what I had on there, but I think we're just gonna to have to live with it. Okay, so let's widen things out here. There we go. It's not too bad. Not too bad for an hour and a very complicated uh, painting. This would be, obviously, this is a nice start. Um, I, could, I could clearly work on this for hours more. Um, and my guess is Pissarro would have done this, uh, you know, done some paintings for a couple of hours, maybe come back the next day. But the, the, the impressions were all about sort of the experience of being outside and, and doing uh, a more immersive uh, experience outside rather than doing them in the studio. Okay, so let's go back. We've, we're right at the top of the hour. So maybe we can have a few show and tell. Um, let's get this back up. There we go. 
I apologize for the shaky camera. It didn't seem to get any worse. Maybe got a little bit more stable as we moved along. So apologies for that. I have no idea what's doing. I'll probably just unload it and reload it. And hopefully next week that'll be all cleared up. But maybe we can have a few look-sees here. Patty, oh, Patty did a drawing. And I think your background is, is making it so we can't see your picture. Oh, there, oh, there it was, almost. Now it's all blue. <laughs> I think if you move it back just a little bit, Patty. No, now it's out of focus. Yep, there you go. All right, good. Lights and darks. You can see a nice little series of textures there in that. Yeah, nice, nice work. All right, we got anybody else? Anybody else want to give us a little? There is that looks like watercolor. You did a little watercolor version of this one. Very nicely done. Yeah, you got that, you got that red there in the foreground. See how that really just activates all those greens, really makes it uh, kind of vibrate off of each other. Nice job. Way to, way to take a, a, a media risk by doing some watercolors. Nice. And then we got Alice. You can see Alice's forearms, but I, that's about it. Putting you on the spot, sorry. Sorry, Patty, or Alice. Oh yeah, there you go. All right, got everything blocked in, ready to go with uh, the rest of the, the color palette that sort of got the greens and the blues in there. Nice, excellent, good job. Composition looks good. Tia, oh yeah, that's very nice. Is that another watercolor? Somebody doing a watercolor again? Nice. Everybody's going off and doing their own thing. That's awesome. All right, Shana. Yep. All right. Oh, I, I like the way you really up that red. I, I, I like I like our little red addition to the to the whole color palette here. We've we've spiced Pissarro up a little bit. Nicely done. And you worked big too, Cindy. All right, great. Worked a little bit, sort of looks like a little bit more medium. Is this another watercolor? That's not a watercolor. Can't tell. It looks very, uh, I can't see that. It does look watercolory, sort of. Oil, no, it's oils. Yeah. Just working a little thinner, which is nice. That's a good base to work on. Then you can come in with some sort of chunkier, um, more impasto passages and, and, you know, even push that even further. That looks great. Nice. Anybody else? Morna. Oh yeah, nice. You got a lot of color in there, and you want a little more purple in that foreground. That's cool. I would have never thought to do that, but that's that's sort of much richer soil. Looks like it just rained or something there, and it's and it's all chock full of compost and wet earth. Nicely done. Those little splashes of red too, kind of around that trellis. That looks really good as well. All right, anybody else? We got Graham. All right, ooh, yeah. Went a little uh, Gauguin with that orange. I like that, that's very nice. And those sort of more muted greens, sort of muted intense color. That's a nice combination too. That can also, contrast doesn't have to be just you know, light and dark. It can be intense colors and more muted colors, um, opposite colors, complementary colors. Yeah, lots of ways to make it work. Nice, very nice. And sun, Shantapa, how'd I do? It's pretty good. All right. Nice job. Yeah, that's really good. The drawing is really good on that one. You got everything in place. Just keep plugging away on it, and, and you know, be nice and loose and and have fun with the application of the color. I mean, the impressionists were out there racing against the elements and racing against time for the you know, amount of light was left in the day. So just have fun with it. That looks really good. Great start. Yeah. We got anybody else? Oh, there's Sarah. How are you, Sarah? That looks great. Great start. Oh, you want a little bit sort of more purple, purple red on the, uh, on the earth in the front. Uh, in the front garden, that looks great. And those little touches of 
It's like a it's like a wreath of flowers right there in the middle. And kind of a nice little pattern in the in the center ground there, the middle ground. Great. The drawing's well done too. Good job. Cool. We got anybody else? Uh, Clementina. Very nice. Oh yeah, good. You got the the basic structure of it blocked in. You got the nice curve of the uh, garden. Just kind of throw in some of that red. Eventually, it's a good thing. You can just with oils, you can just you can just set it aside. It's not going to dry on you anytime soon. So you can go take a break and come back to it, and uh, and it basically pick up right where you left off. Unlike acrylics, which dry really quick. Yeah, very good. Anybody else? Susan, oh, you worked on last week's as well. Oh yeah, very nice. Great job. That painting I believe is also in the National Gallery. So we could see the last two paintings have been in Washington DC. So if you're in Washington DC, write it down and have a look. Nice job. Sarah, oh yeah, you, you work nice and small. Yeah, that's good. And the, the texture in your paint looks great. It's got a lot of um, sort of pattern and sort of heavy impasto passages. Nice. Very good. Anybody else? Lisa? Oh, yeah, nice. Those That variety of greens is great. Very, very earthy greens, but the value range is good. Nice job. Anybody else? And there's Diane. Yes. Oh, you went real earthy with that with that garden. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah, very nice. I I feel like I I was going too fast for people. Everybody is sort of at sort of the mid stage. I was I was must have been like a whirling dervish or something doing this painting tonight. And J F Matt. I'm sure that's not your name, but that's who you are on the screen. Yeah. Oh, that looks great. Yeah, the there's a lot of underpainting through, so you've got to put in those more earthy colors, but that's a great uh, pickup on the composition, sort of those warmer colors peep, peeping through the, uh, the green that you have established. That was really good. Nice. Anybody else? Okay. I think that's everybody. All right, well, folks, yeah, thanks everybody. very much. Let me, uh, I'll just throw mine up here. So I'll just hold it up here. And I mean, you saw how was, uh, the, the reason why I chose these Impressionist paintings is it really lends itself to just kind of quick, uh, you know, active brushwork. Um, and it, I, I think a lot of people get hesitant when they're, when they're painting, when they're starting out or they're not comfortable painting. This sort of forces you to kind of break that up because there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. So you can kind of get, get your green brush and your red brush and just kind of let them interact a little bit. And, um, and really ha have fun with it. All right, folks, thank you so much. That was, I love that one. That was a lot of fun. Um, I have some sad news. This is my last month of doing these for Michaels. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in sort of keeping track of, of things that I do and, and stuff like that, um, you can kind of go to the, my website and get on my mailing list or the Instagram and, and things like that. I'd love to sort of keep in touch and see how everybody's doing. Um, and I do run workshops virtually and things like that. So that's another uh, thing to, to take into consideration. So if you, you wanna write that down, feel free to do that. Um, I'd love to see what everybody's up to. Okay, um, thanks very much. I will be here next week. As uh, this is next week is premium a premium class. These are the same amount of time. They're an hour long. This one's going to involve uh, a Van Gogh and working with heavy impasto paint. Um, so you can see that on the website. And then the last one of the month uh, will be another uh, Still Life by Henri Fontaine Le Tour, which is a lovely little painting. Um, and they're all posted online. So um, yeah, thanks again. Hope to see you next week. Have a good night. Have a good week. Thanks.